So good morning. Um, my name is Stefan Turner. I'm a physicist by training. I was learn, learning about elementary particles and mathematics for it. And uh, I did, after my studies, two postdocs, one in Germany, one in Boston. Um, by the time I was looking for um, a career in particle physics, it became clear that particle physics was um, beginning to be a dying horse. So I did not want to embark more on this. And I studied, I started, started to study uh, economics as a, second, as a second option. Many of my physicist friends were um, getting jobs in the banking industry and working for big companies. And usually they were working in the basements of these big companies in offices without windows. So I thought, if I have to work for a big company, then I want a room with a window. And I, and I figured out that economists are always in uh, having these better offices. So that was my main motivation. Well, it's not quite true. That was one motivation, the economics. And then I, I got, um, by chance, the chance to visit the Santa Fe Institute. And um, this completely changed my life. I became interested in complex systems. I met people there who were studying their own problems. They were, um, so for example, I met uh, Murray Gell-Mann, the great, great physicist who invented the quarks, one of the things he did. Um, and I saw that he was not studying what he was supposed to study, namely elementary particles. He was studying languages and the development of languages. And every, almost every person I met there was um, working on their own problems. That's what I have learned there. You can follow your own, follow, um, um, you can define your own problems and then, and then try to work and solve your own problems. That was maybe the most important thing I've ever learned. And from time on, I'm trying to, to work on problems that I, that I find interesting. And I do nothing else. <laughs> This is maybe an advice I can give to you. So, um, and ever since, I'm interested in complex systems. Complex systems um, are, are um, systems that, that always involve somehow networks, that are always of a little bit of a chicken egg problem which makes them hard to solve, like chicken egg problems always are hard to solve. And that's the topic we're going to discuss now. They are driven processes, driven processes and non-equilibrium processes. That's the topic we're going to study today. And one fifth characterization, complex systems do very often not follow Gaussian statistics. Very often complex systems are stochastic. They have random components. At the distribution functions of these systems, then you will not find Gaussian distributions. You'll find power laws or, or distribution functions that are close to power laws. You find distribution functions that have a very fat tail. That means that you have outliers. You have, you have statistics of many, many, many outliers. Outliers in complex systems are the norm. If you have a Gaussian statistic, a Gaussian curve, you don't have outliers. The big, the very big and very small um, events are totally, perfectly strong and totally suppressed. Not so for power laws. And um, and um, we all know where. Uh, where the Gaussian distribution comes from, or does anyone not know where the Gaussian distribution comes from? Why, why this is so omnipresent in many areas? Central. Central limit theorem has everyone has heard, or who has not heard about it? The central limit theorem. Then I say in two sentences what it is. If, if you all have heard, um, very good. So the central limit theorem is a theorem that tells you if you add random numbers that are not too crazy, that have a finite variance, if you add um, the sum of these random numbers gives you a Gaussian distribution. 
And in all, most all of our measurements, very often we are adding one source of error with others, and at the end we get, if we measure something, very often we get Gaussian. Okay, today let's start with, uh, so the topic is we talk about statistics of complex systems, um, and let's motivate ourselves with two things. So, complex systems are driven systems. Driven means I have to put in something into a system, then, you, for example, it's energy. I have to put energy into my computer, and then something comes out of my computer. It's typically heat. Also, some pictures come out, but it's, it's um, um, energy goes in and heat goes out. If I plug out the computer, it's no longer driven. What will the computer do? It will go to a rest state. It will no longer work. It goes to a, a, lower, a lower state. Or uh, if you think of living systems, to put food in and water in, what are you producing? You're producing heat. And um, if you stop eating, you go to lower and lower states, you will change your metabolism, you will go to resting states, and eventually you might even not survive. You go to a, a final state. So any driven system is a driving part, that's the electricity or the food, and the relaxation process. The relaxation process is just what you get if you plug out or if you take the driving away, what happens to your process? It's relaxing to lower state. I think that's a generally true statement. Um, very often, you have the case that if you, if you look at the process, as the process um, unfolds over time, the number of possibilities gets less and less. So we call this sample space reducing processes. Sample space is shrinking over time. Sometimes you're opening your sample space. For example, also if you learn something, that might open lots of possibilities. But once these possibilities open and you take decisions again, what you do, it starts to reduce again. So it's reducing, sometimes opening, reducing, sometimes until, until stop driving. So we call these sample space reducing processes. If you can think of such a process in different ways, I give you many examples during this hour. Um, if you imagine a set of dice that you have, the first die has one face. If you throw it, it always gives one. Then you have this die number two, has two faces, it's a coin. You have relaxed to your lowest state, and now you have to. Now you can either say, "Okay, I don't, I'm bored," or you can say, uh, "Now I restart the process." And then you take. After taking die number one, you go back to die number n. That's a. You have a relaxation process. It's sample space reducing, and you have a driving process. And let's call this driving process very, let's call it slow driving. Wait until the process hits the ground state, the lowest state, and then we drive it. We could have restarted it at any point, but we come to that later. So just to give you um, an, another example, if you form sentences, this is a sample space reducing process, usually. I can start with the with an English dictionary, collection of words, I can, and if I intend to form a sentence, I pick one of these words. The first word, I cannot use every other word anymore, because grammar and context forbid it. If I, if I just use any other word in a sequence, it's nonsense. I cannot convey information. So, choose a noun, most likely, I have to choose, a, given English grammar rules, I have to use a, a verb next, and the verb has to somehow relate to the biological um, 
nature of the of, 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 of the first word that I've picked, and I so it reduces my sample space. As soon as I pick something here, the sample space further reduces until I come to the point. Right? So I, as I form the sentence, I'm, I'm narrowing possibilities. If I'm not doing that, I cannot convey meaningful information. I think so. I don't know. I don't know many languages, but um, I think um, most languages are, are structured this way: that we have to start somewhere, become more and more and more specific. Of course, we can put a comma at the end of a sentence and then start again with a big uh, sample space and then reduce it again. And after the point, we restart, we begin the next sentence. So this is yet another way of, of seeing a sample space reducing process. This is a number of states that you have. And you have a ball, and the rule is you can only jump downward. You jump random distances from right to left, but you can never jump upward. Sample space reducing, right? At every step, the number of possibilities gets smaller. Um, just to compare with this process, we have 10 states, and the ball can jump left and right. If we now count how often every state, if we know how often a system is visiting a certain state, we can describe it statistically. We, we know everything there is to say about this system in a, st in a statistical sense. So if we want to know the nature, statistical nature of this system, we let the ball jump, we are sampling, draw the and it turns out to be uniform. Hmm? Okay. If we are looking at the, how often are these states visited, we get this distribution. This is a very particular distribution. This is um, um, Zipf's law. Um, what is Zipf's law? Zipf's law is one of the most famous power laws that exist. If you, if you, if you cannot sleep at night and you and if you bad literature. What you can do is you can start counting words in your book. And you can do a statistics of words. You ask, how often does the most frequent word occur? You count the number of this, the article the most frequent word in English. You find it occurs X times in your book. And say, how often does the second most frequent word occur? It occurs X half times. The third most frequent, X third times. Hundreds most frequent word x over hundred times. That's Zipf's law. It's one divided by x. R rank R. So rank one means frequent word. And this is the distribution that comes out of here. And we write it like this: the probability to visit state i is one divided by i. What I just told you. And why? Why is that? So. Um, Let's run through it. The probability that we find the ball at the ith state is the probability that one time step before we sit at state j times the, the transition probability that we jump from j to i. Is that clear to everyone? Yeah? And then we sum over all, all j's. It can sit at any j. From j, it jumps to i. If we sum, and if we know the transition probabilities from any state j to i, then we can compute the probability that we end up at i. Now, to solve this, this is a so called eigenvalue equation. That's a matrix, typically, usually. So what is this transition matrix? This transition matrix that I jump from j to i is 1 divided by j. You see that? You see that. And if we are at the lowest state, so 
So in this case, all the time when we are at one, we restart the process, we put it up to the highest state. The probability that this is happening, that we are going from the lowest state to any state, is one divided by n. Okay, and if we plug this, this into here, we get this equation. Everyone fine with it? P of i is, this term comes from here, plus the sum of all states that are larger than i. This is the, this part, and this is the probability that we sit at j right now. If we do this for the, for the next i, we can do the same thing for just increasing i by 1. We get a very similar equation, or it's the same equation, where we just add, um, wherever we see i here, we add plus 1. And then we compute pi plus 1, negative pi, and all the terms in this sum cancel, and we are just left with this, with this equation. And this is, if you have an equation like this, we can try to solve it. And the solution is this. P of i is a constant times i to the negative 1 divided by i. Do you see that? Does anyone see it? Does anyone want to show it? It's repetition of what the logarithm is, a little bit of an integral. No? So this is only, on, only interesting part. This is, you can see this as a difference, a differential. So this would be, I, I don't know, this would be d, dp. And um, I could bring this part over there. here. And um, on the right hand side we would have this 1 divided by i. Does anyone know what that is? If we have d differential divided by huh? d log, d log p d log p by and ah okay so we could put also a di down there that's one that's why it's not written here here's a di if we take ah yeah okay so it's d log p i is negative uh, 1 divided by i di. If we take integrals of this, this is the log of p of i is equal negative 1. What is this? Of the log. Log of i. Is negative, four, negative um, 1, we can put that up here. And if we exponentiate both, we get something like um, um, i to the negative 1. It's not really true, because if we take integrals, we get a constant. And if you, if you look um, what that constant is, just let's look at the first state. At the first state, the probability probability at the first state is p1. So at the first state, um, this is 1. 1 divided by 1, this is 0. So this is log of first state. Log of the first state is equal to c 
Okay, that's the constant. If we add this constant here, it's just multiplying with the first state, and this is the result here. Okay, so it's not very hard. It's high school math. Um, and we derived Zipf's law for the probability distribution of any sample space reducing process. As I said, this is very, very frequent in nature. Um, Okay, if we restart the process earlier, if we don't wait until the ball is, has fallen to the lowest state, but if at every point in time we restart the process with a probability one negative lambda, lambda being a number between zero and one, if we restart earlier with a driving rate, one negative lambda, Again, can in exactly the same way, I show you on the next slide, we can compute the probability of sitting at one state, and that probability is equal to a power law um, with an exponent negative lambda. One negative lambda is the driving rate, the exponent is um, the exponent is directly related to lambda. This is again the same, so the derivation for this is exactly as we had it before. The probability that we are at state i is the probability that we are, before that we are at state j, times the transition probability summing over all possible states j. The transition probability is a little bit more complicated now, because we have this term that we start the process at any point in, um, in time. Then we get this equation, we do the same trick. We, we write this equation where we look at the hi next higher state. We subtract them from each other. We get this equation and solve more or less like this. Exactly like this. Okay? For all systems that are sample space reducing and that we drive at the constant rate, we get a power law. That's a very strong result. Now you can say, um, okay, um, ah, okay. Here's, here's when you simulate the thing. If you don't trust what I said, you can simulate. Here's the state, um, and here is the, the probability distribution. How often you visit those states, and you see this is a perfect power law. If you have slow driving, if your lambda is equal to one, if your lambda is, is smaller, um, uh, smaller, um, like 0.5, your slope is also 0.5. Or one negative lambda is your slope. Now you can say, ah, that's very specific. You, you, our sample space reducing process is, is just, the probability is just um, um, proportional to the remaining interval. But we can make it much more more general, we can look at prior probabilities to our states. So if we have our states, one to six, it can be, for example, that, that some states are much, much more likely to be visited. State six is much more visited than state three. If, if you're sampling this process, if we're taking random samples by uh, uh, illustrated here by this ball jumping left and right. If we count how often the ball hits six and how often it hits three, we get this distribution. We are recovering or we are measuring the, the, the prior distribution. And if we take the same states, the same prior probabilities of visits, and we make a sample space reducing process out of it, just allowed to jump leftward, what do we get? We get slaw again, the SIF distribution. We don't feel the prior, the prior probabilities are irrelevant. That's shocking. Sure, 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 sure. Interrupt me if you if you have questions. Interrupt. How do we take into account the prior probabilities? How do we take into account the prior probabilities? We would put uh, on. 
we would put here, here we would put a, a q i. Okay, and um, then as gets more complicated, not incredibly complicated, but then you can see what can I do, what do I have to do with the prior probabilities to break Zipf's law, and you will have a hard time finding an example. If you are completely overdoing it, if you are If you're making this state 99% of all the times being true and the, say, and, the, and the fifth state filling up almost all the remaining rest, then you can break it. So if these, if these prior probabilities are super exponentially, if this is a super, something that grows stronger than an exponential, then you break it. But this is pathological. This is not really a stochastic system. You have one dominant state and maybe one or two other states, and it's not relevant. Um, okay, so the prior probabilities are practically irrelevant. And we, we, we were talking about this, that a driven system is driving plus relaxation, and the relaxation of any process, I think this is, is, is correct, Maybe you find you can find a, uh, an example that is not correct. Any relaxation process is a sample space reducing process. Where we're going to lower and lower states. And um, what I was saying before is that the prior probabilities don't matter. The, um, it means the details of the system, how it relaxes, doesn't matter for the statistics of the system. And that's, that's kind of an interesting result because it tells you um, no matter what the details of the complex system is, I know that the power law must come out if it's a driven system. Even if we take out large parts of the, of the sample space, um, the, the result stays the same. So meaning that not all transitions must be possible. I don't have to reach every state from every other state. That's not necessary. <coughs> and let me show you another example of, of what a sample space reducing process is. Um, and it's um, an example of diffusion on networks, very special networks, basically it's trees. So if this is our process, we can represent this process as a network where we have states and from higher states, is the state is, is one, two, three, four, five, if you don't see it, five, one. From higher states, we can jump to all the lower states. And when we restart, we bring it to the highest state and immediately jump down to lower states, meaning restarting means that effectively we can reach from the lower state every higher state. So this is a network. It's a fully connected network. It's a little bit boring because it's fully connected. And it's, what's important is it's directed. So the situation is like this. If you have a network, we have to direct it. So we, we, give, we have to give some, some kind of ordering on the network. If we put numbers here, we can say we direct the network in a way that we always go from higher numbers to lower numbers. Let's do that, then we get these arrows. Now we, now we have a directed acyclical graph, acyclical y, because there's no directed cycles. Here's a cycle, but it's not directed. So we cannot walk around, here we cannot go back to five. So this is a, um, an, a DAC, a directed acyclical graph. And if we, have a, if we now put a random walk on this, we have again a sample space reduced process. So we, now we put a random walker, and at every point in time, it can jump to one of the outgoing nodes. So if we put it at 13, we would jump to 12 with certainty then with 50-50 chance to 6 or 10, 
and then we, with certainty we would jump to one. And there we would rest. It's the same thing like that I've seen before. Diffusion on acyclical graphs is sample space reducing. Um, yes. An example, if you, if you try to do simulations, you take a random graph, you direct it, you put random walkers on it, and then you count how often is every node visited. It's a practical question for many reasons. You see, if you plot the node visits against the node, um, yeah. Um, if you, here's the states, here's the number of visits, it's zips. Or the almost exactly Zipf's law. Um, if you take another network, completely different from a random graph, if you put, if you make it directed, walkers on it, you get Zipf's law. Nodes are visited in exactly the same way, even though the network looks very, very different. If you take completely crazy network, out of the blue. This is the network of co-authorships in high energy physics. If you put random workers on this, you get Zipf's law. So this is the same statement that I made before. Prior probabilities are irrelevant. That statement, if we have a random network, and if we put now, now we put weights on the links, and our probability to take a certain, if I have two links to choose from, the probability depends on the weight of the link. If I take a link distribution, distrib I get Zipf's law. If I put a power law weight distribution, which is completely different from a Poissonian, because I have many weights that are pretty big, um, I get exactly the same distribution. So all we have learned about networks becomes irrelevant. <laughs> no matter what the network looks like, the statistics stays the same. The statistics of a, of a diffusion process on these networks. Again, this means that the prior probabilities don't matter. If we put cycles in the network, now let's think that we allow directed cycles. If we do that, this is equivalent to bringing, to going from a lower state to a higher state. That's driving. So if we put some cycles in the same random graph, we can change the slope. It's no longer minus one. It is minus lambda. 1 minus lambda being the driving rate. The driving rate is, the, is proportional to the number of cycles we have in the system. So we can look at the visiting distribution and infer from the slope how many cycles are there. So we can count cycles by looking at the slope. If we put more cycles in, the slope changes, it uh, becomes flatter. Okay. So this is just to see how this abstract notion of relaxing processes, uh, uh, sample space reducing processes, uh, relates to networks. So I think what we see is that that SIP's law and power laws are an immense attractor. It's almost as, as the the same as the central limit theorem, which is an immense attractor. So, no matter what the network looks like, we get Zipf's law. No matter what the weights are, we get Zipf's law. And if we have cycles in it, we get exponents that are less than one. Less than my, yeah, less than one. Good. If you if you think, the example, if you imagine that you're looking for something, then this is a sample space reducing process. If you're searching in a clever way. Clever means you're looking, if, if you're looking at some space using the possibilities, you will never look there again. You have, you know that it's not there. Reduce, by every search step, you're reducing the possibilities. Yeah. So 
So how do we find um, that search works? Lots of, of, of internet website clicks are the result of a search process. Looking for something, and then you're clicking one, two, three steps if you don't know exactly the address. This is an early image of the distribution of web visits. How often is a node visited? Exactly the same thing we done before. Um, the internet is, of course, an acyclic. Uh, it's not acyclic. It's not acyclic. It can, or it will, it has cycles, but very, very few. Uh, it's a, um, almost acyclic directed graph. Clicking on it is a diffusion process, so the number of node visits should be SIP's law. It's almost SIP's law. Why? Because people are not doing clever searches. Some, some is just totally targeted. You know the address, you go there. And some is, is completely random. You also go back. It's then not clever. That explains maybe this. If you have clever search, there's also experimental results for clever search. This is um, um, click rates on, on, on pages in companies. So in a, in a compute deck company that used to be a computer producing company, people hired there, they were looking for parts of programs that they could use uh, or other technical things, and this was organized on, a, on web pages, of course. And if people are searching there, these are trained people, clever people, they really need to search, have to do it in an efficient way. They, no matter what company it is, they really do it in SIPs, in a, in a SIP law fashion. Now, I've told you that we can get power laws with exponents from negative one to zero in this range. What about steeper slopes? If we have a situation, sample space reducing process, but every time before we jump, we are multiplying. We are multiplying all by a factor of mu. In this picture, it's two. Before we jump, we make two balls out of it, and they independently jump down. And every time before you jump, you multiply and then go down. And you can go with exact same page of deriving um, a distribution function that has an exponent mu, which is the multiplication factor. And a multiplication factor can be any number from zero to infinity. If it's below zero, it means that we are that we are not multiplying, but we are taking balls out of the system. They are dying. They are going away. So it's, uh, okay. So whenever you have cascading processes, expect your your um, being larger than one. You can do simulations of this, and um, of course it's. It, if you're doing the simulations right, it has to come out what the theory predicts. So if you look at this process, and if you are a physicist, you might be reminded on a cascading process that occurs in nature, and that's cosmic rays, for example. If they come, atmosphere, they split. One particle that comes splits into two. It's called hadronization. And these particles split into two. Um, so you get a cascade of particles, or this is happening in the, in, the, in the accelerators. If you hit two beams, particles come out of it. So in, in, in more or less such a fashion. So is this a theory for, for cosmic rays or for particle physics? Of course not. But if, if we do the following. If this was a particle, it has a certain energy, and the energy of, of the outcoming particles, this energy plus this energy must be this energy. In physics, we have this, this dogma that energy must be conserved, and we would have to put that in, right? If we do that, mathematically, you can show one page, two pages. If you do that, your distribution function becomes this. It's, 
1 divided by i squared, no matter what the multiplication factor is. And what is interesting is that this result was derived in a very, very complicated, not very complicated, in a, in a complicated way by a physicist called Enrico Fermi, who built the first nuclear power plant um, when he was studying cosmic rays. So we can do it. You can arrive at the same result as a pure statistical, statistical, um, with a statistical method and imposing energy conservation. That's all that we have to do. Okay. Um, so how many of you are physicists? Okay, quite a few. So here's another, another way of, of seeing um, sample space reducing processes. Now, now really physics. Here you have a medium. Imagine a box with atoms in it. And we are shooting one atom into that box with a certain kinetic energy E0. Okay? Every time this thing hits an atom in this box, the kinetic energy goes down. It can never go up. So it's sample space reducing. So energy, if you just follow the energy of this particle, we mark it, we shoot it in, and then we see that the energy is going down step by step. The energy over time, if this is time, energy is always going down. And that means it must be that the logarith logarithm or the yeah, logarithm of the probability to find the particle with energy E against the logarithm of the energy must be a power law, must be Zipf's law. And that's the case. You can measure that, or it has been measured since 1920s or so. So, um, yeah. Last point, maybe, um, yeah. Last point, and then I show you many examples of, of power laws. We have our states again. And we do one more modification. At every state, a, there could be a different probability for restarting. Yeah? Depending on the state, if we have a, a restarting rate that depends on the state, and if this is somehow a function of the state, this is the, the restarting rate, the driving rate, if it becomes a function of the state, happens then. We get this form. It's again one and a half pages. Very simple math. This exponent, or not exponent, this, this uh, one negative driving rate is equal to this. And here is the distribution function. We can relate the driving rate, this, with the distribution function. And if the driving rate is a function, it determines the distribution function. So this is, again, the, 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 the proof. This, the clever thing is, is, the intelligent part is to write down the transition probability from state k to state i. Here's the prior probabilities. Here is the, the, the um, driving rate function and if you plug this into this uh, formula, as before, we get this ratio, and if, then, then we solve in exactly this way, as before, and we get, we get this relation. Now, if we look at this relation, let's look at special cases. If lambda is equal to 1, put 1 here, um, do, do the integral, then we work out P, so everyone can do that in, in one or two lines. Um, and we get Zipf's law. Probability of visiting state X is one divided by X. Let's check it. If, if this is one divided by X, logarithm of one over X is negative log X, so we're killing this, um, this 
um, minus sign, taking the derivative of x uh, is, is, is 1. So um, we just have this minus x here. No, no, we have 1 over, no, we have 1 over x. This kills this x, and lambda is equal to 1. If lambda is a constant, we get a, a const, we get a power law. Probability of visiting state x is x to the power negative alpha. So that was the, the first two cases we were discussing. Slow driving, constant driving rate. Every state is driven with the same probability. If we have a linear driving rate, meaning that higher states are driven more frequently than lower states, um, if this is a linear, the simplest form, this linear form, we get the exponential distribution or the Boltzmann distribution, if you wish. If we have the driving rate, we get just a superposition of these that we have that look in the double, log double logarithmic plot like this, that power law and then an exponential cutoff. This is this, uh, this situation here. Some people call this the gamma function. It's the same, just interpreting this constant in a different way. If the driving function is a quadratic, um, is quadratic in the states, we get the Gaussian. If the driving function is any power law, we get stretched exponential functions. If the driving function is a logarithm, we get the log normal distribution. If the driving function is a little bit more complicated, it's a product, if it's a product of an exponential and, and, and x, then we get the so-called Gombert distribution. And uh, if we add, if we add, um, if it's a power plus a constant, we get the Weibull distribution. And more distributions, I think you, <laughs> you will never need in your scientific life. OK. So again, if we have slow driving, we get Zipf's law. If we have constant driving, we get power laws. If we have extreme driving, driving after every step, we're just sampling the prior probabilities. And if we have um, state-dependent driving, we, depending on how we drive the system, it determines our distribution. It can be almost every distribution. And with very, very simple driving functions, we get the spectrum of all distributions, of all of statistics that we have ever learned in, a, in practical courses. So let me summarize again um, a couple of um, sample space reducing processes. Have you heard about self-organized critical systems? No? Self yeah, yeah, you have, some have, some do not. Hmm. Um, up to now, what, what is, if someone asks you where do power laws come from, the correct answer would be come from four different types of mechanisms. One mechanism is criticality. This is, some of the physicists might know, criticality is the statistical mechanics, the physics of um, matter at critical points. If you're at phase transition points, at this point, Physics is sometimes very strange. You get divergence of correlation functions. There you get power laws. That was first observed in the 50s in physics. The second mechanism to get power laws is multiplicative processes plus constraints. If you have a multiplicative process, that means you're multiplying random numbers. If you're multiplying random numbers, what is the distribution? 
distribution of the product of a product of random numbers. If you have a product of random numbers is equal to a, a number, and what how is that number, the product, how is that distributed? Sorry? I don't understand. Each of them comes from a distribution that's in the, and, and each of them is drawn independently and, and the distributions are, have a finite variance. So this I should have said. Um, if, you have a, if you have a sequence of, of random numbers and if you multiply them, if you have random number x1 times x2 times xn, x, let's n be pretty large, if we call that pi, how is pi distributed? If we take the logarithm of this, the logarithm of this, this is equal to the log of x1 plus log of x2 plus log of xn. If we have, these are still random numbers. These are logs of random numbers. And now, if we're adding random numbers, we said we have what? The central limit theorem, Gaussian. This thing, the log of the product, is Gaussian distribution. So we call this log normal distributions. If you, that's not the power law. But if we make it constraint, if we, if we say that these x cannot be smaller than a certain, certain um, threshold value, then it becomes exactly power law distributed. <laughs> Pi becomes exactly power law distributed. That's the second mechanism. <coughs> Multiplicative process with constraints. The third is um, preferential, preferential, not attachment, preferentiality. So, winner takes all dynamics, self, uh, uh, self uh, enforcing processes. Maybe you have heard about preferential attachment in networks. That's the third mechanism. Those who have lots of links get even more links, or those who are rich get richer. Uh, and the fourth mechanism is self-organized criticality. Self-organized criticality is, is um, there for certain systems that look as if they were critical, as if they were living at a phase transition point, but they are not fine-tuned to this critical Parameters. They don't have to sit exactly at, at, at the critical temperature or critical pressure or uh, critical um, parameters. And the most famous example for, um, for self-organized critical system are sand piles. So you're dropping sand on a table and you, you, have, you, you, get, you get a sand pile it gets steeper and steeper and steeper. If it's too steep, avalanches go off and it becomes flatter. You keep dropping sand, it's getting steeper. And your slope is self-organizing to a critical slope. That's the, that's the story behind it. The power law, if you look at the, at the sizes of avalanches that go off, that's a power law. If you look at the, the time distribution, uh, yeah, the size distribution of the size distribution of avalanches is a power law, and the, and the time these avalanches take is also distributed as a power law. Um, clearly, sand piles are driven system, driven systems. If I stop dropping sand, it will go to a relaxed state. So, uh, and therefore, self-organized critical systems are a subset of um, sample space reducing processes. Multiplicative processes are not a subset of this. 
but um, uh, preferential attachment, self-reinforcing processes are again a subset of this. So sample space reducing processes put together or unite three mechanisms, or two or three mechanisms from the possible mechanisms to get power loss. Okay, so this is was my answer to what are self-organized critical systems. Whenever we are searching for something, we have sample space reducing processes. Whenever we are fragmenting things, breaking things, we have sample space reducing processes. If we have a stick, you break it, you throw away the, the piece that's not marked and you marked piece, you break it again, keep the marked piece, measure the length of the marked piece. The distribution, if you do this many, many times, the distribution of length of your marked piece is going to be a zip flaw. Um, sentence formation, um, human behavior is sample space reducing very often, like language. So if you think of yourself as, as an action time series, very often you're doing coherent things <laughs> over time. So if you if you, um, you you're doing a whole sequence of, of things where one where, which you cannot reverse, which which where one leads to another, you open the the, the toothpaste thing, then you put the um, toothpaste on the brush, and then you. If you do it in, in other orders, um, you can do it, but it's crazy. Many games are sample space reducing. If you start a game of chess, then um, in the beginning, the, the possibilities become more and more. It's not sample space reducing, but it is, at a certain stage, it comes to a conclusion. And you get less and less and less options that you can do. Same is true for Go. Record statistics, has anyone heard of record statistics? This is the statistics of records, so if you have a random process, you ask at every time step when you observe a new outcome of a random process, is this a record? And um, sample space reducing process, just, just um, an example for it. Okay, I think what I could do if if I have five more minutes, I show you a couple of examples how how um, how important non-Gaussian distributions are. So just to show you a couple of examples of power loss. Look at city sizes. It's the population of a city. Very few cities have 10 million and more uh, inhabitants. Many, many, many cities have 1,000. A, um, a population of 1,000. It has a tail that's more or less a power law. Rainfall is, if this is the size of a rainfall, every event, every rainfall has a certain uh, amount of water that comes down. It's the size of the event. How much water uh, rains down? It's a power law. Landslides, if you look at when mountains come down, how big the, how much mass comes down? It's a power law. Hurricane damages are power laws. If you look at the distribution of financial contracts in, in, um, in the interbank market, for example, very beautiful power law. If you look at forest fires, these are power laws. Moon crater diameters, perfect power law. Why, why are these power laws? So a moon crater is what? It's a, it's, it's a result of an impact of a, of a meteorite. What is a meteorite? 
it's a fragment. Very often it's a fragment of something. If we have fragmentation processes, we get power laws. So the distribution of masses of, of meteorites, of uh, distribution of energies of meteorites is power law. Therefore, you see power laws in the moon crater distribution. These are the, um, if you look at energy distributions in the solar wind, of the particles in the solar wind, or gamma rays, not particles, gamma rays in solar wind are power law distributed. Movie sales are power law distributed. Healthcare costs in England are power law um, distributed. In particle physics, this is cross sections over many, 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 many uh, orders of magnitude. We see power laws. Um, again, what is this? This is fragmentation processes. Words in books. This is what I told you. If you count the number of words, the most frequent word, second most frequent word, third frequent most word, Slip's law. This is citations in scientific articles. Nice power law tail, not here. Very often you have a shoulder here. Website hits. I've shown you these are sometimes search processes. Here is negative one. Here is maybe another power law. Book sales. Telephone calls, earthquake magnitude. This is Richter's law. All of you know that since childhood. This is how earthquake quake magnitude, energy in earthquakes is distributed. The number of seismic events is power law distributed. War intensity, killings in wars, sizes of wars, wealth distributions are power law distributed. Family names, and, and, and. In networks, Literally thousands of power laws in, in, the, in the degree distributions, in the, in the distributions of clustering coefficients versus degree. Uh, and, um, wait. and very often also in the nearest neighbor degree distribution. So these are the things where you find power laws in networks. There's dozens, maybe hundreds of scaling laws in biology, metabolic scaling. I don't know if you've heard of it, very beautiful. Dynamics in cities is full of power laws. If you look at the, the, num, the GDP of cities, of the walking speed of people in cities, the number of patents in the city, the number of creative people in a city, the number of um, criminals in a city, this is all power. If you look at fragmentation processes, we did that in many random walks. You've got a little glimpse on, on um, what I mean by that. Um, blackouts, the fossil record, you, you find power laws, um, and, and, and. Okay, so it looks as if Gauss doesn't play a role in <laughs> ever. Okay, thank you again.